it's oxidative stress is the biggest number one risk factor when you're messing with these things. And unless you have a good understanding of what oxidative stress is and how to mitigate it, it doesn't matter what blood pressure medication or statin you use. And that maybe brings us to the first topic, right? We have a, a list of topics. I want to know from you guys um, what the harm reduction models are and have those changed over the last couple of years? Because everybody's about harm reduction and risk mitigation. Um, and then we have IFB pros who we all <laughs> aspire to look like. Um, but I don't think they go hand in hand. Something that I see firsthand now that is very new to the industry is uh, years ago you had the guys that were enhanced like mm -hmm. pro bodybuilders right or or the our gym rats that were just wanted to do gear and you had natural guys right and there was a clear line between the two right and you you knew what you were and you kind of hung out with those guys and you had a very firm belief in what you did right there were sometimes mm -hmm. obviously natural guys would become enhanced guys over time but now there's this odd use of trt right like trt has become this over popular thing with young kids, <laughs> right? That don't, yeah. clearly don't need TRT. That's where that, I, I think TRT in and of itself is a fantastic thing. I think when you have 20 year olds doing TRT, I'm not sure what the function there is because they're probably not hypogonadal. And then on top of it to play with this, this supposed safe thing is then they're adding other non, at least in America, they're adding things that are not legal, like pre bomb on top of this to leverage a performance benefit without ever actually using testosterone as a performance tool, right? They're just like, it's it's almost like using Lantus. <laughs> They're just creating like a baseline with testosterone and then stacking other things on top under the guise of TRT, right? Or some sort of enhanced TRT. And then you have everything above that, right? Then you have the standard steroid cycles and stuff. But I think that this is where, whether this was from our other friend in Thailand who created this, this supposed safe model of usage, <laughs> wherever this came from, <laughs> This is what's confusing to me because when you look at the data, like guys like Bazin, right? We've seen yeah. mm -hmm. so many times that up to 600 milligrams of testosterone was considered safe for, for healthy individuals. It's where, where this all of a sudden came from that testosterone was not a good thing and you want to leverage all sorts of other stuff on top of it, you know, at, at, the, lo at the low level, at the TRT level. It, that's, I think, what's confusing to me is why is that considered safer, right? And also then why is it considered safer to use something like Masteron to control estrogen versus something like an AI, which has been proven? Yeah, it's, um, it's just, I think people like to reinvent the wheel and get credit for stuff. When in reality, the credit always goes to the researchers. So there's a lot of studies, at least on testosterone and nandrolone, that shows that it's somewhat safe and efficacious. Um, and then when you do the similar research on other performance enhancing drugs or other anabolic energetic steroids, you see that the safety and efficacy or the efficacy is there in the medical treatment, but the safety data is severely lacking. So there's now a lot of extrapolation from animal models, whether that is uh, safe or not. Well, we can go to this uh, this study. So this is the, the Basin study where they go from 25 milligrams testosterone to 600 milligrams testosterone uh, per week, correct? For 12 mm -hmm. weeks mm -hmm. or 20 weeks? 20 weeks. Yeah. And, and then there's a washout period as well. Like yeah, there's a washout weeks. period as well. Yeah, so this is quite an interesting study. Um, this is one of the few high-dose studies where they actually compare different dosages because there's other studies where they go in reasonably high dosages, but that's all in particular medical treatment. This is in uh, healthy individuals. And is this a study where they were specifically instructed not to train? Mm-hmm. Or is that the other one? Uh, it should be this one. And what, what's fascinating, though, from a background point of view on this study is at least, again, I can only speak to what goes on in the United States. In the United States, until Bazin came out with these things, the, the medical community here was in disbelief that testosterone had any positive effect on muscle. So as a whole, physicians didn't understand that testosterone grew muscle. It was disputed. So we refer, like in the endocrinology world, it's actually referred as like the pre-Bazin era and the post-Bazin era, which we were living in the post-Bazin era now. So well. he, he was... He was pretty groundbreaking in what he does and what he did. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's it's very interesting to me, these kinds of studies, because it also shows, I think, the, the changes on lipid parameters and liver enzymes, and they track quite a few markers. And with Anivar, that's also been indexed. Uh, I mentioned that in my Anivar deep dive. But a lot of the things that are now part of um, risk and harm mitigation models um, are either not studies on humans at all, 
um, or have never been studied on healthy subjects. Yep. They've been studied on uh, postmenopausal breast cancer, mm -hmm. right, or, or short stature or something like that. And then the dosages are ramped up to, well, in the grams, which is, I don't know, it's, it's hilarious to me, but at least testosterone is bioidentical. If you want to run, run, ramp that up to a gram or two, um, that is what bodybuilders, pro bodybuilders have been doing for decades now. And, and to kind of ramp up something else that isn't even um, FDA approved for humans anymore, always seemed a bit weird to me. Now, does it get results? Of course it does. But there's a lot of different things that get results. Dean, what's your take on it? Because you, you're, you've been very adamant about harm mitigation, you know, for a very long time. Yeah, and, and I mean, I, I've never, you know, when you're accused that you're against medication or whatever, I've always been like, well, use a medication for the right purpose that it's designed for. And I guess one of the things that we probably all agree on the same point of view is, you don't just start taking medication for what ifs, like what if I get blo high blood pressure? You take it to address blood pressure. Like right. it's, when we look at, you know, harm reduction, again, the tree was probably shared the same thing towards oxidative stress is the biggest number one risk factor when you're messing with these things. And unless you have a good understanding of what oxidative stress is and how to mitigate it, it doesn't matter what blood pressure medication or statin you use. If you don't address oxidative stress, the statin is buying you time, basically. And, you know, that's, <laughs> you know, when we look at yeah. the, the models of cardiovascular disease since like the probably the late 2000s, they're now starting to really see the beauty of oxidative stress and foam cell production causing yeah. arthroscrotic plaque as opposed to oh, well, high LDL is dumping cholesterol into the arteries through ApoB. That's part of the equation. But the other side of it is if you've got LDL particles and you lower the production of cholesterol with a statin, the incidence rate of the relative risk reduction with a statin, I think, is like 3 in 100. So it's 3% people from a primary setting won't have a heart attack. And that's because you're still oxidizing cholesterol at 100% of the capacity. It's just 50% the number. So when you're coming at it from that angle and the biggest thing you can actually educate someone on then is oxidative stress and viewing that LDL is just a particle being made in the liver for a job, but it's getting, you know, damaged in the process going around the body, whether that is oxidative stress from anabolic steroids, depleting, you know, intracellular glutathione or vitamin E, vitamin C, or whether that is your nutrition or the environment itself, like uh, pollution or electromagnetic radiation, whatever's going on, by understanding that oxidative stress is your biggest enemy when you're using these, um, I guess, anabolic steroids, even testosterone, you're setting yourself way above having yep. the requirement for any medication to begin with. That should be like your pillar at the top of oxidative stress with your sort of nutritional choices, how you're gonna mitigate the oxidative stress risk, and then from there, look at, okay, well, what medications fit the different problems or purposes that I require? So, yeah, there's no arguing that angiotensin 2 goes up when you take testosterone, if you are either genetically susceptible or in a dose response relationship setting. And that doesn't necessarily mean like straight off the back because you're using testosterone, here's your A or B. It's designed to serve the purpose of, you know, like we done a podcast, me and Kurt, of if your blood pressure goes up, immediately question your environment, your nutrition, so your hydration balance, you know, um, how much fluid you're ingesting, uh, I guess, arterial flexibility. In, Even sleep. In terms of, you know, how sleep. much sleep you get. Yeah, yeah sleep it, apnea, all it, these al things contribute. Alcohol, even eating fruits and vegetables will lower it. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's like... You're looking at the bigger picture than immediately using a drug to solve a problem, which is great, which we have clear open access to address problems very quickly with medications. But they're normally addressing the symptom as opposed to the actual root cause. So when, when I started to sort of even come into the scene, it was with that viewpoint of having like conventional pharmacology training of how drugs were designed to treat problems. But from my own study then of like functional medicine of asking like the root cause question of why do you have high blood pressure? Why do you have high 
uh, blood glucose, consistently asking why until you get to the bottom of the, the problem. And I guess that's where like even my, uh, when I went into chemical engineering, it was always asking why has the problem happened until you get to the root cause.